if you have been in the faith for some time, you would have heard of the three missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. These are all recorded for us in the book of Acts. In these journeys, each one lasted many years. The Apostle Paul and his companions were spreading uh, the good gospel of grace, both to the Jews and also to the Gentiles. On his first journey, he was joined by Barnabas. And their initial strategy, if you like, was to go to the synagogues and to uh, speak to the Jews about the Lord Christ. But the Jews rejected their message of Christ and the cross. And their hatred of this message was so much that the converted soul, who we now know as Paul, who used to be the persecutor, became the persecuted one. It was on this first missionary journey that he was stoned and left for dead, but God spared him because God had a purpose for him. Remember, he is a chosen vessel for the Lord. They then turned to the Gentiles and preached the gospel message to them. After much controversy, and as God would have it, the Gentiles were saved without submitting to the Jewish traditions. We'll skip the second missionary journey for a moment, but on his third missionary journey, his preaching was also confirmed with miracles. It was on this journey, in particular at Troas, that as he preached a very long message, someone fell out of the window and died. Now, don't you die on me this morning, okay? <laughs> I don't have the power to raise you back to life. The moral of the story, brother Tim, don't fall asleep during the message, okay? Because I won't be able to revive you. But jokes aside, it was on this third journey that there was a revival at Ephesus uh, where those that were converted burned their books of magic. Uh, those hocus focus that they used to believe. But while there was a revival... There were also riots propagated by one silversmith by the name of Demetrius in his uh, opposition to Christ and his devotion to the false god Diana. The oppositions and persecutions during this journey, beloved, only made the churches all the more faithful and solid in their faith. Yes, they have seen the heartaches of the Apostle Paul had suffered. And yet because of that, their resolve as a body of believers all the more became strong and they spread the gospel throughout. Acts chapter 15 to chapter 18 records for us the second missionary journey. It was on this occasion that there was a sharp contention between Paul and Barnabas. The contention was so sharp, the disagreement, if you like, was so uh, heavy that the Bible says they separated from each other. And as a result, two missionary teams were formed. Barnabas took John Mark and went to Cyprus, and Paul took Silas and headed to Asia Minor. On their way, the Bible said that they were forbidden by the Holy Ghost to preach the gospel unto Asia. And they were redirected to go to Greece, Macedonia to be uh, specific. This redirection is what we now know as the Macedonian call, uh, where the apostle preached at Philippi, Salonica, and at Corinth. It was such a productive mission trip, beloved, that his son in the faith, Timotheus, was saved on this second missionary journey. Uh, the Philippian jailer and all of his household were converted at this journey. Uh, Lydia, 
a very prominent businesswoman uh, who, who was saved again along with her household. Uh, she became very faithful in the church, uh, that she used her, her house and, and her resources, as uh, Francis Havigo uh, did, uh, to be hospitable to Paul uh, and for the cause of the gospel. The journey gave Paul the opportunity to preach at Berea, uh, where many believed, and the word of God was received with readiness of mind, the Bible says. They were searching the scriptures daily, as the Bible said. It was also on this journey that Paul preached that famous message at Corinth, in Corinth at Mars Hill, uh, and declared to them the unknown God. The unknown God that they were ignorantly worshipping at the time. This mission trip allowed Paul to find his friends for life in Priscilla and Aquila. What a wonderful mission trip. I wonder if they did not obey the redirection of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if they would have insisted on what they have originally planned to go to Asia Minor, I wonder if their ministry would be as productive as it was. There is a point to be made here, beloved. When you and I are in the center of God's will, when you and I are obedient to the prompting of the Holy Word and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and we would be obedient to what it says, there is blessing. And there we can do so much more for our Savior Christ. Now why did I go through these missionary journeys? And even more specifically, uh, the ministry at Macedonia. Only to set the background for our text and our theme this morning being missions. Open your Bibles please to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The title of our message this morning is Grace Giving. If you will excuse me, I really need to wet my tongue. It's good to have water in it in here, isn't it, Brother Tim? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Would you stand with me, please, as we uh, read God's Word? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Our Father, thank you again for the opportunity to serve you in this way. Lord, as we're holding your preserved word in our hand, I pray that the Holy Spirit once again, who indwells us as believers, would teach us the truth. Help us to see our lives before the pages of this holy word this morning. I pray once again, Lord, that you would anoint my lips. And I pray, Father, for power from on high, help me to preach and help me to preach well. Help me to preach compellingly. That, Lord, that we would not be entertained and be made to feel good. But, Father, that we would indeed see the message that is contained for us in these few verses. We now commit our time to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As I've said last Sunday, uh, over the course of this month, our focus and our theme is missions. Uh, we're looking forward to Brother Glenn 
and uh, Brother Gary coming over to preach to us what the Lord has laid uh, on their hearts about missions. And uh, what we're doing is we're preparing our hearts. Uh, we're uh, asking the Lord to work within us that even before these men of God would come, our hearts are already primed. We have already been uh, uh, fed uh, the principles of the Holy Word about missions. You see, on the outset, let me say this, mission and mission endeavors of any local church needs money and lots of it. I'm not here to get into your wallets, okay? I'm just here to preach the word, so I trust that you will not shut off over the course of the message because I want to prove to you that when it comes to giving, and in this case, missions giving, or any giving in the local church for that matter, money is really not the issue. It never is. The issue is the heart of man. So please, over the course of the next few minutes, let the word of God speak to you, speak to me, speak to all of us members or not. After all, God said of his people, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 7. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth it up. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 7. Beloved, you have what you have today. Because God allowed you to have it. Or you may have worked hard. Or you may have been diligent. But ultimately, you were able to earn a living. Or you were able to prosper in your own business because God gave it to you and blessed you for it. And I trust that that blessing that was given to us, we are being good stewards of it. Now just before we get in our text, can I say to you that there are many ways to give. And in the scriptures, there is the giving of the tithe. Some people believe that tithing, the giving of 10%, is only true in the Old Testament. And it started with the law of Moses when it was given. You see, tithing and all the discussions and the narratives about uh, tithing gets lost because we forget the very underlying reason, the essence and the principle of tithing. And when I say tithing, I don't necessarily mean just the 10%, beloved. When I say tithing, it is that underlying principle that there is a portion that is God's. And not man's. Back in the garden, God said to Adam, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but, but the tree of good, of knowledge, and evil. See, there's that principle. There is what is exclusively for God, and there is what He allowed us to consume. And use for ourselves. That's the underlying issue about tithing. But many get upset because somehow there is the 10%. And many get upset because somehow uh, they felt forced to give the tithe. But it's never yours. It's God's. And that portion is for him. So really, when you give your tithe, you haven't really given God anything. <coughs> Think about it. Because it's His. It is that portion that He has set aside for Himself. Beloved, as far back as the Genesis account, we can see the principle of setting portion for God. Adam knew it. Cain and Abel knew it. Abraham knew it. He did, not, did he not give a tithe to Melchizedek? 
Uh, Jacob knew it. In fact, uh, Jacob uh, vowed unto the Lord that he will give the tenth back to him. Genesis 28, Genesis 14 for Adam. Uh, these men and the time that they live in, uh, beloved, is, was well and truly before Moses. And yet we see the principle of tithing all the way back there. So the tithing principle wasn't instituted at the law. It was after that that when God commanded his people Israel to give a portion, the tenth, to the Levitical priesthood as their tithe. But even before that, the principle of tithing is clear in scriptures. Before God even made that command, to give the tenth to the Levites. So the principle of tithing, beloved, that of setting apart of that portion that is not ours, but God was before the law. And I believe that principle is well and truly taught in the new covenant as well. In Matthew 5, the Lord Jesus said, He didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. In Matthew 23, again, the Lord Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Now, if you stop there, you think that the Lord Jesus is sanctioning that tithing is no longer important, because these Pharisees have neglected the weightier matters of the law. But the verse continues, okay? Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done. And then he said, and not to leave the other undone. Not to leave the other undone. In Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul giving instructions about the law and about faith in the context of salvation. Uh, in verse 31, he asked, Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Then he said, not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. In essence, he was saying that the principle, and I repeat, okay? Don't misunderstand me. The principle, uh, the principle of the law and not the law itself is what is going to be upheld, okay? So that principle of tithing is included in that. We are now living in the age of grace, praise God. We are no longer subject to the law of Moses, that's true. But the principle that has been uh, dealt with at that time is still true today. It's still true. It's still true today that thou shalt not worship any graven image, is it not? It is true today that we are not to fall into adultery, is it not? Those were the commandments of God back in the Old Testament, and that did not disappear just because we're living in the age of grace in the New Testament. Beloved, the principle of tithing is true back in the garden. It was true in the beginning of the law, and during the time of the law, it is still true in the New Covenant. Okay? It's there. It's very clear. Here in our text here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul was not talking of giving the tithe. That's already assumed. But he was talking about grace giving. That's why I've entitled our message this morning, Grace Giving. He was reminding the church that a year ago, they made a commitment to giving for the saints in Jerusalem, okay? And in his missionary travels, in his missionary journeys, he was boasting to the other churches that the Corinthian church promised to give for the needs, for the fellowship and the ministering of the saints in Jerusalem. So as he traveled in the many churches, he was saying to these other churches, look, the Corinthians have promised to give for the ministry in Jerusalem. Now, because of this boasting, the other churches then got encouraged. They felt challenged. And they said, we would want to do that as well. And here we find that the Macedonian churches, because of what Paul boasted for the Corinthian church, we want to do that as well. 
And they did. They fulfilled the promise. The other churches, what they promised, they've done. But the Corinthian church, by this time, a year has already passed, still have not performed what they have promised. Did you keep your faith promise commitment last year? Don't answer that. God knows. Here we find that the Corinthians promise, but they haven't actually fulfilled that promise. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Beloved, the word grace here is charis. Means graciousness. That manner. That act. It's that divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. Did you get that? Charis means it's that divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. It's that gift, that grace, that joy in liberality. That's what the word means. Beloved, that is the grace that is mentioned here in our text. And God was the one who bestowed that grace to the churches in Macedonia. And it's the same God that bestows grace upon all of us here at Calvary Baptist Church. Now that grace that was bestowed was not meant to be stowed. It's meant to be shared. And they did. These Macedonian churches. How? In verse 2. How that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Now understand that they were, number one, in affliction. Not just affliction, watch the language of Scripture here. Remember when I talk about emphasis in the Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit? Great trial of affliction. They just don't have a headache. Okay? They're not just uh, short of uh, funds to buy some superfluous things that are not necessary. They are in great affliction and they are in deep poverty. That's the description of the scripture here. Now, but in spite of that, unlike the Corinthians, they actually kept what they promised. In spite of their condition of being afflicted greatly and being in deep poverty. Now, I haven't been born here in Australia. All you have to do is look at me and hear the way I say and pronounce my syllables. You would understand that I haven't, I'm not a true blue Aussie. Okay. But we are pretty shielded on poverty here in Australia. Sure, we see people that are in hardships. Sure, we, up to this moment, I still don't understand why people would be homeless. But we see it. But as a nation, by and large, beloved, we haven't really been exposed to that deep poverty that is happening in what we call third world countries today. Is that true? And we are blessed as a nation. We are blessed as individual families. We are blessed as a church because we haven't really been exposed to the deep poverty that is perhaps mentioned here in our text. But let me ask you, perhaps this is not applicable for all of us, but there were times in our lives where our expenses are more than our income. Now I can say that for a fact with us. The budget as such is in the red, is in the negative. And there were times in our life that it was like that. Now you have two options to fix the problem. Fix the problem. 
you either increase your income, you get a second job, uh, you push trolleys or whatever you need to do, clean some toilets, scrub, fill up shelves to add to your income, or you decrease your expenses. It's fairly common sense to do that. When the budget is not lining up, you will have to do what you need to do to make sure that you make ends meet. Now, as you decrease your expenses, the first thing that you would remove from your list of expenses normally is those things that you do not value the most. Isn't that correct? Those items, those areas, those situations that you believe are expendables, that you can do without. That's what you would do, and most of the uh, people that I know, that's uh, the logical thing to do. Beloved, if in those times that your budget is in the red, and it's just not meeting up, and if it's the first thing that you would cut, is your giving to God and His church and His cause, you have proven one thing in your life and in yourself. Hard for me to say this, but you don't value your Savior and His church as much as you would value your cup of coffee or your expensive car repayments or your mortgage repayments. If the first thing that you will remove out of your budget is your giving to Christ and His church, you've proven one thing. You value those things before you value Christ. Hard word. Understand. If in those times that your budget is not where it needs to be, if that's the first thing that you would do, you showed how much you value your Savior. Can't sacrifice the clothes. Can't sacrifice the shoes. But the offering for the church and missions, sorry, God would understand. You know what, beloved? He does. He does understand. Because He's a merciful God. He's a gracious God. He knows what we're made of, flesh and blood. And he would not zap you. He can. He understands that we are made of dust. He knoweth our frame. And those times of failings, for those times that we withheld, for those times that we haven't given him what is dutifully and rightfully his, he would understand. That's right. That's correct. He is merciful and he is gracious. But can I ask you, if he is the first one that you take out of your budget, then your value of him shows. The one that gave his life, the one who died so that you and I will live, is that our value of him, God forbid. I don't know your bank accounts. I don't know how much you earn. I don't know what your list of expenses are. But he knows. And so on this particular missions month, I want you to consider your budget. These churches in Macedonia, according to the apostle, were in great affliction. They were in deep poverty. Uh, Yet look at the verse. They abounded unto the riches of their liberality abounded into the riches of their liberality. Okay, verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. In essence, the Apostle Paul is saying, for their own abilities I am a witness of. They are giving what they are able to give. And I bear record of that. I know that. I'm a witness of that. But look at that verse again. And beyond their power, they are willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. 
Now here we find these believers, they gave according to what they can. Now there are things in my own life that I can do without thinking much of it. After tonight, after the f uh, preaching, uh, uh, after all the fellowship, uh, I would uh, uh, close the, the blinds, I would put on the, uh, the cover for the piano, I will turn off the air conditioning, I will then look at the, the back rooms, make sure that the air conditioning units are turned off, uh, I will do whatever I need to do, turn the light off, close the gate, I go home, I can do that, no sweat. It's within my power. But with the uh, ideas and the, the prayer items in my list at the moment, how to refresh the building and, and upgrade it, uh, that it would be uh, such a, a glory to look at for the Lord. Uh, uh, the things that I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, the, the baptistry here and, and uh, doing of uh, making this front uh, to, to be a, a bit better, uh, the ceiling, this... Uh, uh, gigantic uh, air vents here, all of that, that's not within my power. You know why? Because I have ideas, I have thoughts about it, but I need a brother Branko, uh, a, a pastor Wesley, who are knowledgeable in these things uh, that can make those things that I'm thinking of to make it happen. That's not within my power. And besides, I cannot do anything as much as I desire that to do unless you, the church, approves it. It's beyond my power. The Macedonian believers, they were in affliction. They were in great affliction. They were in deep poverty. They gave according to their power, within their ability, in that small, meager income that they have. And I don't have time to explore this, but if you look at the time when this was written, what was happening in the then known world in Greece, there is economic depression. So with the little that they have, they fulfilled, they kept the promise. But then the Bible says that they gave beyond their power. That means they gave what they didn't have. For what? Verse 4, for the fellowship and for the ministering of the saints. The object of their mission giving were the saints in Jerusalem. The object of our mission giving are the flags represented here, the big ones. Uh, don't forget that as colorful as they are and as fancy as they are hanging over the ceiling, there are real people behind these flags. There are real families that are in different parts of the world right now sharing the good gospel of grace to people that probably do not want to hear it. And they're there not as a holiday. They're there to work for the cause of Christ and the gospel. That is the object of our mission giving. And we are the ones, the ones represented in these small flags. We are the Macedonians, if you like. Perhaps we are in some affliction at the moment. I understand that. Perhaps there are some needs that we have, physical needs, financial needs uh, that we have at the moment. I get that. Perhaps some of us can give within our abundance. It's no sweat for you to write a check. But for some people to commit to a faith promise offering of $10 a week, it's a big deal. I get that. But to their power, they gave. In spite of their affliction, beloved. In spite of their deep poverty. And then they went beyond their power. The one amount that they do not have. Why? Because they were trusting on the grace that was bestowed upon them by no other than God. You see, we are the ones. We are the ones that will do that. So in closing, how did these believers do it? How could they have given beyond their power? How? The answer, beloved, is found in verse 5. And this they did, not as we've hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. 
They first gave themselves to the Lord. And secondly, they believed in Paul and his companion and his cause of reaching out to the uttermost part of the earth to share the good gospel of grace that was imparted to him that he, whereas before, who would consent to the death of the Christians, is now the one that is sharing the good gospel of grace to those ones that he persecuted and more. Remember what I said during the introduction? When it comes to giving, money is not the issue. It never is. It never us. It's never, I should say, um, we didn't own it. It was given to us. It's always been there. The issue is the heart. This is what I mean, beloved. The Macedonians in their great affliction, in their deep poverty, in their power, and beyond their power, they gave. How? How did they do that? In our times today, as it was in the time before, we do it by the grace of God and by giving of ourselves. That is the very first step. So as you write your little amounts on that little faith promise commitment slip, the first question I want to ask you, have you given yourself to the Lord? Because, beloved, if you haven't given yourself to the Lord, the reality is, you will not serve. You will not share. And you will not uh, part with your dollar that's in your wallet if you haven't given your heart to the Lord. That's the key. How can you and I give beyond our power? It is because of that grace that was bestowed by God into this church. Our mindset needs to change. It never was ours. It's God's all along. And he wants us that bestowment of grace. He allows us to use it for our own enjoyment. Sure, amen to that. But he also wants us to share what he has given us. You and I cannot do that because our natural bend is to keep it, beloved, and enjoy it for ourselves. But when we give of ourselves to the one that has given us, that bestowed upon us that grace, it's easy to give it. Because there's something within you that has changed. You have in fact, embrace the grace of God. A while ago, the ushers distributed to you this little uh, literature, and uh, I made a point to write a little bit of a report here so you can be aware of uh, what has been done to your money, and I've given you some principles here, what faith promise is, and so you can look for yourselves and study it for yourself. Uh, we didn't give this to you as just a handout, Consider it, pray about it, and once, like I said, when you're at peace with it, when you write your little amount there, a little number, it doesn't matter how much it is. For some of you, you can put uh, several hundreds of dollars in there. For some of you, it will not be the same amount. The amount is not what's important. It's what's in here. And what you want to commit by way of trusting the Lord to supply that thing that you cannot give with your own power, you see. So if you and I are to give in this missions conference, if we are to commit some amount to the missionaries, it will have to be done by that grace that was bestowed upon us. Now, Pastor... If God is so rich as you said, why do I need to give? 
If God can support these missionaries everywhere else, why do I need to give? Has God run out of money? Has he become bankrupt? That's a foolish question. He can never be bankrupt. And yes, he can support these missionaries even if you and I don't give. But you see, God wants to use you and me to fulfill his program. He's giving us the opportunity, just like the Macedonians did. And you know what? They took it on. They kept the promise. They gave in spite of their situation. My friend, if you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, God doesn't need your money. In fact, this church, as thankful as we are, we don't really need your money. We have come this far for 44 years, coming to 45 years, and I am confident without a shadow of a doubt that whatever we would need in this place and beyond, God is able to supply. What I'm teaching you here as your pastor, as someone that prays and loves you, is that we would understand the true meaning of the grace of God and that by that grace we would learn to give. So why do we need to fill up the uh, a little slip then, Pastor? If there's a commitment between me and the Lord, uh, why don't I just do that and not write it? You see, because we are mortals. We are fallible men. We need to be given the guidance of how much to budget for for 2017 to 2018. After this missions conference, someone has to write a letter to these missionaries. Someone has to say to them, Beloved, we appreciate what you're doing there in the field of Romania and in the field of East New Britain, uh, in uh, Ecuador, in Myanmar. We believe in you, but we can't support you anymore. I don't want to write that letter. I would rather that we would apportion the budget so that everyone will give the portion. But beloved, we have come this far as Calvary Baptist Church and thank you to your faithfulness all these years. We are budgeting a significant amount of money for missions and I pray to God that we're able to do that. In fact, when you look at, uh, when you take your little coffee later on, on the left side of that supper room, you'll have envelopes in there with their prayer cards and their prayer letters. I want you to know. I want you to hear from them. Many of you are not able to come here on Wednesdays when we talk about these things. But it's there for you. Read their prayer letters. Be encouraged of what God is doing. And be challenged of their needs. And when you do, would you write that amount in that little sleep? It doesn't go to me and my salary, beloved. It goes to these people. Because I love them and I appreciate them as you do. So I consider... Brother Glenn will be here, and he will talk about reaching the world for Christ. We have a representation of that. And we have the opportunity to be like the Macedonians, that in our time of affliction, and there is plenty in the church, we are afflicted, are we not? And in the times of our poverty, I don't know, you're dressed well today and you're all smiling and you've got your little jewelries. No, I don't know your bank balance, but God does. And some of you are earning this much, some of you are earning this much. You can give according to your power. I'm asking you from the word of God, give beyond your power and you can by the grace of God that was bestowed upon us. Prove God. And let him show you how that he can supply the need. And then we can all celebrate and write to these missionaries, brother, we are able to finance you for another year. And guess what? We're also adding more to what we have supported you with. Oh, what a beautiful letter to write. And when I write these letters, I don't just sign my name. I say on behalf of Calvary Baptist Church. Consider that grace that was bestowed is not meant to be stolen. It's meant to be shared. 
Again, I go back. If you're here and you're not a believer in Christ, you may have a religion, but you may you don't have a relationship. God doesn't need your money. In fact, there is nothing that is in you that God needs. But you, on the other hand, you need all of God. And I encourage you, give yourself first to the Lord. And then, just perhaps, you can give for his cause. But the first thing you need to give is yourself. Realize that you're a sinner and that you cannot save yourself. That there is a time appointed that you will face your maker. And when that time comes, you need a pass-through, if you like. You need the Lord Jesus Christ to have, been, that, to have paid your penalty that you should have paid yourself. If that is your desire, when we sing a hymn, would you come? Allow us to show you from the word of God how it is to be saved, how it is to be born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit, as God said. If that is you, would you give yourself to God today? He knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. Thoughts, But beloved, you that have a profession, I thank you from the bottom of my heart as pastor of Calvary Baptist Church now. Thank you for your faithful giving in 2017. But I implore upon you, let's be like the Macedonians. Let's give beyond our power so we can continue to fulfill our great commission to the uttermost part of the earth. And perhaps, if God so allow us, send another to a mission field somewhere, or perhaps support someone that's already in the field and share the good gospel of Christ. What a chance. What an opportunity. Our Father in heaven, I thank you that we have your word to show to us principles, Lord, that we can follow and obey. I pray, dear God, that as we uh, see these flags, uh, that we don't see them as just decorations, that indeed we would see them as lives, people that are in the mission field right now, doing their bit for the spread of the good gospel of grace. Help us to give in spite of our afflictions, in spite of our poverty. In sp uh, give, let us give on our power. But more than that, help us to trust you so that we can give beyond our power. Help us to prove our love to you. Help us to enjoin ourselves in the mission field for the harvest of souls. We give you praise. We give you thanks for the wonder that you are. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.